Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkie listeners. Today, Clarissa and I sit down with Dr. Timothy Burton. Dr. Burton is an affiliate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, where he has a private practice and conducts research. He has achieved board certification in general, child adolescent, and forensic psychiatry and addiction medicine. He is a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Child Adolescent Psychiatry, founding fellow of the Academy of Eating Disorders, and founding member, former president of the Eating Disorders Research Society. Dr. Brewerton has authored more than 170 articles and book chapters on many topics in psychiatry, including eating and related disorders, psychopharmacology, neurobiology, post-traumatic stress, dissociation and the effects of childhood sexual and physical abuse. He is the editor of the Clinical Handbook of Eating Disorders and co-editor of Eating Disorders, Addictions, and Substance Use Disorders textbook. He has reviewed for more than 50 scientific journals and has served on editorial boards for the International Journal of Eating Disorders, Eating Disorders, the Journal of Treatment and Prevention, and Eating and Weight Disorders, and has received numerous awards, such as the Craig Johnson Award for Clinical Practice and Training by the National Eating Disorders Association, Honorary Certified Eating Disorder Specialist Award by the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals, and Best Doctors in America. Dr. Brewerton attended LSU and Tulane University School of Medicine, completed a psychiatric internship and residency at the University of California at San Francisco, worked for the U.S. Public Health Service at Hawaii State Hospital, completed a research fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health, and later a child adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Medical University of South Carolina. He served as medical consultant at Medical University of South Carolina's National Crime Victims Research and Treatment Center. In today's episode, Dr. Brewerton shares his professional path, where does food addiction fit in with eating disorders, neuroimaging and differences in the brain, differences in eating disorders and food addiction, how to move forward with the food addiction diagnosis proposal, volume addiction, how his textbook, Eating Disorders, Addictions, and Substance Use Disorders, has been received, treating comorbid conditions and the roadblocks to helping our clients, and our signature question with a twist. Welcome, Dr. Brewerton. Dr. Brewerton, thank you so much for being here with us. Let's just get started. Can you share with us and our audience your personal story, your professional story, how you became interested in working in the field of eating disorders, addiction, substance use disorders? We even noticed your wife has been a contributor to your work. So we're really interested to hear. If That's you right. Well, first off, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, that's kind of a a long and winding road of the story. But early in my career, I was never terribly interested in substance use disorders or addictions. I was interested in serotonin, and I was interested in mood disorders predominantly, and I was interested in research and in the new biological psychiatry. I went to, I knew I wanted to be a psychiatrist when I went to medical school. My childhood sweetheart's father was a psychiatrist. Her mother was a psychologist. And so that bug bit me very early. And then I serendipitously ended up at the National Institute of Mental Health doing research in eating disorders. They wanted someone to study serotonin in eating disorders. And that's kind of where I ended up. And it ended up really working out for me. And in the course of treating a lot of individuals with eating disorders, once I came to Charleston and started the first uh, eating disorder program there, I encountered a number of folks with comorbid substance use disorders And these patients were among my most challenging. And as I learned more about them and their conditions, I discovered that underlying trauma, 
child maltreatment and PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder were very important etiological components of these disorders. And that's kind of how I kind of entered the field of addictions, kind of through the back door, through the eating disorder door and through the trauma PTSD door, if you will. And yes, my wife is an advanced practice uh, nurse practitioner, PhD in nursing, one of the first PhDs in nursing. She's a full professor of psychiatry at the Medical University And she has been doing research in the role of PTSD and trauma in substance use disorders. That's been her focus. And so, yes, we share certain interests uh, overlapping in trauma and PTSD, but learning from her and going to many of the conferences she's gone to and she's gone to many of the conferences I've gone to, you know, we've seen and I've seen that there's a tremendous overlap in these subspecialty areas. So that's kind of how I entered it and, and, you know, how I ended up where I am. And then, and then food addiction came onto the scene, thanks to uh, Ashley Gerhard in large part and others, uh, Nicole Lavina, uh, Bart Hobel, who I had studied and heard speak uh, at a number of uh, eating disorder conferences earlier in my career. And they were the first to show f- sugar addiction in animal models. And then shortly after that, uh, Ashley Gerhardt coming out with her Yale food addiction scale was really a game changer. And many of my patients early on would spontaneously say to me, I'm addicted to food without any prompting whatsoever. And I thought that was interesting. And so I paid attention to this when Ashley's work came out and I thought it was, you know, interesting. And I started asking my patients, particularly those with binge type eating disorders, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, binge purge type. I started asking them, do you experience this as an addiction of sort? And yes, how did you know? And I got this really dramatic and passionate response from a lot of people. And it really kind of um, enhanced the therapeutic alliance because they felt like I really understood at another level or a deeper level kind of what they were going through. And so it just kind of jived with me. And I, I learned early, you know, it's really important to listen to patients. Patients are our best teachers. And I've kind of meandered around the field, kind of just following my bliss, if you will, and and following what has interested me and being a researcher, uh, but I'm primarily a clinician that's informed by research and have had uh, an interest in research and have done research, but I'm primarily a clinician. And and I think the best research is one or or research that actually is uh, clinically applicable and makes a difference in patients' lives. And that's what it's really all about. Yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there and let you continue on with the questions. So we have heard that people say that eating disorders share the same pathology as addiction. Do you believe this to be true? And then where does food addiction fit into this? Well, things are always more complicated than we'd like them to be. I would say that there are shared aspects of pathology or pathologies. It's not just one pathology in eating disorders, just like there's not one pathology in substance use disorders or mood disorders. Eating disorders are not singular entities, nor are substance use disorders, nor are mood disorders, nor are, you know, psychotic disorders or whatever disorders you're talking about. Although we know that restricting eating disorders like anorexia nervosa, restricting type and binge type eating disorders like bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder are related, they are at distinct ends of the spectrum. And they may have different underlying genetic, biological, epidemiological, and environmental kind of components to the pathophysiology, if you will, looking at it from a biopsychosocial model. Food addiction clearly falls on the binge side of the eating disorder spectrum, even though we find people with anorexia nervosa restricting type do score high sometimes on the Yale food addiction scale, and we can talk about kind of the idea of false positives. I don't think that they truly have food addiction, although people can appear to have it. And that's, you know, they can appear to have it when you do or have them complete the Yale food addiction scale, particularly when they're in a starved and restricted state. 
And that that's a kind of I think an, an important point that it really comes out of the eating disorder field is the importance of of dieting, and that's I think the fear of an abstinence model that you're promoting restriction. And that restriction leads to binge eating. And by and large, that's true. And there's a lot of scientific you know, literature to support that. However, it's much more kind of subtler than that. And it is important, though, that we kind of rule out the false positives that we might see in people with anorexia nervosa and, and not just take the results of the Yale food addiction scale at face value. Yeah, that's a long answer to your question. But yeah. No, absolutely. We've talked to David Wist about that and, you know, and that separating the signal from the noise and really realizing that we have to, we can't just take any screening or assessment or whatever tool on face value. There has to be, right. It has to go deeper than that. We really have to look at the individual history and make adjustments as needed. And that, that paper that we wrote together, I think is, you know, we're really proud of because I think it addresses one of the major issues that people get hung up on, particularly in the eating disorder field. And it is a really important issue to address. And, you know, I'm sure that he has probably talked to you about that uh, concept, separating the signal from the noise. Yes. Yes. Yep. Other interviews. Yeah. Yeah. So, Would you be able to explain for us, for our listeners, how the neuroimaging literature really compares similarities between eating disorders and substance use disorders and how it highlights maybe the similarities and differences between like bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder and addiction? Like what? what Not very well. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't consider myself an expert in brain imaging. I'm aware of that research. I look at it, but I'm certainly not a brain imaging researcher. It's kind of complicated uh, when you start looking at what parts of the brain light up relative, you know, in certain diagnostic groups compared to others under and under what circumstances. But we, you know, we have seen some fairly consistent abnormalities when we look at food addiction compared to binge eating disorder, compared to healthy controls, compared to obese controls. Although there, it's not consistent completely. There's a, a lot of gaps in the literature, and we know that there is decreased executive control in both binge eating disorder and food addiction. There's enhanced reward, evidence of enhanced reward pathways in both conditions. There's disturbed emotion regulation in those pathways, and there's often decreased interoceptive awareness, particularly in, in both of those. And so I think a lot more work has to be done. A lot of these studies are in relatively small sample sizes, but there is a lot of overlap, but it's not distinct. Just like we see in other psychiatric disorders, we often do not see distinct neurological signatures that are linked to specific disorders. There is a lot of overlap, let's say, between anxiety and depression and PTSD and substance use. You know, there's, it's, the brain is enormously complicated, and we're still learning, uh, even though we've made such incredible advances. So you stated earlier that, you know, food addiction would kind of be closer to the spectrum of binge eating disorder. Can you yes. explain a little bit about how the pathology differs between binge eating disorder and food addiction? Well, yeah, I think the difference is between binge eating disorder and food addiction lie in how they're defined. And binge eating disorder is, as you know, defined by the the current DSM-5 criteria, and it's basically a behavioral condition and also a psychological condition. It's driven by, first off, the presence of binge eating, which has a very specific uh, definition. And I think In some studies, at least, you know, 40% to over half of people with binge eating disorder will meet criteria for food addiction, which is defined completely by the addiction criteria that we see for all substance use disorders in the DSM-5. So it it involves craving, it involves uh, tolerance, it involves withdrawal, but it also involves a relentless seeking and a compulsion of seeking out substances regardless of negative outcome. And and, uh, it it has a completely different set of criteria that one measures these conditions by. 
So the majority or, you know, in many studies of individuals with binge eating disorder will meet food addiction criteria, but that's not true vice versa. The majority of people with food addiction will not meet binge eating disorder criteria. It's, it seems to be a much more narrowly defined condition, even though there is a tremendous overlap in them. And so it's, it's kind of seeing it from a different lens a behavioral lens, psychological lens from, you know, from binge eating disorder and an addiction substance use disorder lens with food addiction. And I think a number of things can be seen that way from different lenses, of course. But food addiction, I think, is a marker of severity of binge type eating disorder, not only in terms of the severity of the eating disorder, whether it be bulimia, binge eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, binge purge, but the presence and severity of symptoms of comorbid disorders as well. So we know that the epidemiology of, or the prevalence of food addiction is much greater than what has been reported for binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder, it's like, you know, one to 6%. Food addiction, it's 11 to 20%. You know, it's much higher and it includes a lot more people in the general population that in many of whom would not necessarily meet criteria for another mental disorder. But I think people who come to treatment are the ones that are the most severe, the ones that are in most distress, the ones that are, are having the most impairment as a result of these problems in their lives. But from my point of view, you know, in terms of my work, I've seen and, and looking at the literature, I think it's a marker of severity and comorbidity. And so it includes, I mean, that's the problem with diagnoses. They're helpful and they guide us and they help us in research, but they are all kind of narrow in their perspectives because comorbidity is the rule rather than the exception for the most part in psychiatry and psychiatric practice and mental health practice. It's rare to have just one disorder or one diagnosis. And if you do, you probably haven't looked very hard. <laughs> you have probably haven't done a thorough, complete evaluation. And a lot of places are like that. They have very tunnel vision about whatever it is they're so-called experts in, like eating disorder centers, eating disorder programs, or particularly interested in the so-called primary disorder of the eating disorder. And they may or may not evaluate someone for PTSD or a substance use disorder, you know, or what have you. And the same goes for substance use disorder programs, addiction programs. They more often than not don't evaluate people for eating disorder, much less food addiction. And so we all kind of have our biases based on our training and our disciplines. And I think it's, you know, imperative that we take a broader perspective and comprehensive perspective, because I think otherwise we're doing a disservice to the people that we're working for, which are our patients. Yeah. I think we find that a lot. Like all of a sudden yeah. I have a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Right? Like, Abraham Maslow said that. Oh, did he? <laughs> there you go. I knew I had read it somewhere. I'm not that yeah. clever to come up with something no, um, that unique, but yes. Yeah, the father of humanistic psychology. Yes. I uh, love, I love transpersonal Maslow. psychology said that. There you go. And I use his hierarchy of needs to explain things to clients all the time. He was It's, it's so definitely. useful. Yes, and, absolutely. And food is right there at the bottom, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it along, is. Along with safety. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And many other things yeah. that are essential to our lives. Yeah. So kind of growing off of what you were just explaining to us, you know, about how we have to have this broader view on things and it's more nuanced and the yeah. differences between binge eating disorder and food addiction, you know, last year, and thank you so much for your contributions and helping us out with that. So last year we submitted a proposal to the world health organization for the ICD 11 to add food addiction, but we were rejected. It was based on the argument that the ICD had enough diagnoses to cover food problems. And they didn't think that an addiction framework adds anything. And that's in quotes for those of you, because obviously you, you listeners can't hear us. Do you have any thoughts on how we can move this proposal forward? Well, I have to say, I, I applaud you for your efforts to attempt that, but I have to say I'm not one bit surprised by their decision. And I 
think it's just a matter of time before food addiction will be accepted as a bona fide psychiatric disorder. Just to put this into perspective, we have to remember that food addiction wasn't really clearly defined in humans until Ashley Gerhardt's Yale Food Addiction Scale was published in 2009, and, and it's gone through different versions with the update to the SM5 and, and uh, so on. You know, Albert Stunker described compulsive overeating in the mid-1950s and binge eating disorder, which came out of that work, wasn't added to the appendix of DSM-4 until 1994, right? About 40 years later. And then it took another 19 years to appear in the DSM-5 in 2013. So, you know, that's about a 60-year evolution of this diagnosis. And it sat in the appendix of DSM-4 as a disorder that required more research for nearly 20 years before it was accepted. And I think that's probably going to be a similar fate for food addiction, is that uh, the first step, at least from an American psych psychiatric perspective, is that it's going to have to sit in the appendix. First thing is to get it into the appendix so that it can be a focus of future research. and then. And, and I think we need a lot more research to distinguish it from binge eating disorder and other binge type disorders, because it, it isn't completely clear how it's different. We know it's similar and there's a lot of overlap and it can be a marker of severity and comorbidity. But there, there does, yeah, we do need a lot more research. And I think in particular treatment studies, because we know it's a thing, food addiction. But we don't really know how to best treat it because there really have not been good controlled treatment trials. What's similar to like what's happened with binge eating disorder. You know, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy is the best treatment for binge eating disorder. And we know that a number of uh, medications can be helpful for binge eating disorder, right? We have, we've acquired a lot of knowledge about that just in, certainly in my career. And I think that same kind of level of, of uh, inquiry and, and knowledge has to accumulate for food addiction because it's not at all clear how best to treat it, to what extent abstinence is really required. That certainly works for a lot of people, but there's also the notion that cognitive behavioral therapy may very well work as well for food addiction, just like it does for binge eating disorder. It may be that trauma-focused treatments, of the variety of trauma-focused treatments, when there is PTSD and severe trauma in people with food addiction, such as cognitive processing therapy or a prolonged exposure or EMDR, it's not at all clear to what extent those might be helpful for a certain contingent of people with food addiction, just similar to how it is with substance use disorders. A lot of times, substance use does not improve until such time as the PTSD is addressed and fully treated, which is, you know, one of the underlying drivers. And I think it's an underlying driver of eating disorders as well as food addiction in a substantial subset of people. Not everybody, but it's certainly greater than what you see in, in healthy controls and people without food. You know, we're faster learners, so you, there might be an acceleration factor to factor in. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe 64, Even 74, better. maybe. <laughs> we'll see. And Molly and I are actually participating in a study right now for outpatient food addiction treatment with the public health collaboration. So there's a team in the UK, right. team in Sweden, and we are the North American team. And, you know, we're trying to get a subset group of at least enough individuals to kind of determine, you know, abstinence-based model. Uh, does this treatment work, right? That's and great. follow them for two years. And then we're going to hopefully have David Wiss do the little paper on it. So, you know, because we do need to show withdrawal. That's definitely yes. the one thing that they keep saying. And, and we That's see right. it clinically every single, I see it with every single person I, I work with, but we need the papers written yes. on it. That's right. What we also see clinically is 
volume addiction. And since you are did some research in serotonin, I'm wondering if this is something you can speak to because we have heard, you know, the idea of volume, the stretch of the stomach releases serotonin, you know, and this may be like, it's not in our food addiction individuals that we work with. It's not drug foods, nothing that would light up the brain with dopamine. It's just volume. So they can be volume of vegetables, volume Mm -hmm. of protein. They can eat past, you know, the protein satiating marker where they can just continue to eat, but they need that feeling of fullness. Mm -hmm. So can you speak about that a little bit? And maybe if you had any experience in that working with your patients? Well, I'm um, not terribly familiar with the latest on volume addiction, but I've certainly had patients in the past who have eaten enormous amounts of food and it's not necessarily highly palatable foods like you're saying. So I don't know that I can really add much to the discussion about that. It's certainly problematic. I don't know that we would treat it much differently or how we would treat it differently than somebody with severe binge type disorders or severe binge eating. But yeah, that certainly does occur. And I don't think we know enough about it. And that's certainly been our, that has been our experience. We try to ask each guest that it would be appropriate to ask about volume addiction, but they're just, you know, we know like, like Clarissa was saying that there's this release of serotonin and oxytocin, and perhaps that's a backdoor to the dopamine pathway, you know, has been one explanation, but certainly Mm -hmm. I think the way that we have addressed it with clients has been from that like you said, like the binge eating yeah. disorder perspective, you know, where we show up with mindful, you know, mindful eating practices, we do some cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, DBT skills, you know, whatever it yeah. is that that p- certain client needs, we try to address the volume that way. We're just really interested to figure out what that mechanism is is if it's still part of that addiction pathway, like still trying to scratch that itch just in a different way, or if there is something else entirely going on. Well, it's interesting that it does, in fact, stimulate serotonin. And so does eating food and the increased synthesis of, of serotonin and kind of the serotonergic overload that one gets from binge eating per se. And so we know it's kind of a a process of diminishing returns over time because with that increased bombardment of the brain with enhanced serotonin, you actually end up down-regulating serotonergic receptors. And there ends up being more of a hunger and a depletion of serotonin after these repeated binge eating uh, episodes, similar to what happens with substances with dopamine, uh, classically stimulants, but also other other substances, which all kind of meet or mediate ultimately through dopamine. And you get a kind of down-regulation of dopaminergic systems as a result of that repetitive overstimulation. And a a similar kind of thing happens with serotonin and probably other neurotransmitter systems as well. And so it's helpful to get people to behaviorally stop so that their bodies, brains can recover and replenish these deep depressed stores of essential neurotransmitters for normal functioning. Yep. I think, I think it's, we just keep the goal in mind of this is unwanted. The client is saying this is unwanted and we just keep coming at it with whatever we have to help that behavioral piece, you know, go extinct for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the curious part of me wants to know, you know, which is it, but I think as a clinician, it doesn't actually matter. We just, we want the solution and we want our patients to be able to move forward. So, yeah. So we, we often have to think at on different levels or planes. And we're all curious about what's happening on the biological and neurobiological level. But there also can be ways to understand it at the psychological level. And they're not always apparently connected, at least not in our current ways of understanding. But the whole idea of adaptive function, I think, is useful. Kind of what uh, purpose or problem does the symptom solve or attempt to solve. I think that's particularly useful in understanding the role of trauma and PTSD in eating disorders, as well as substance abuse. Often the abuse of the substance, including food in this case, is a way 
to numb oneself to help regulate emotions or dampen, you know, PTSD symptoms, hyperarousal and high anxiety and to dampen flashbacks and to also distract. And so there can be any number of ways that one can think about the purpose or function of the symptom which I think is important to talk about in the, the process of therapy to build the, build the bridges, as I like to say, between the two separate disorders, which live in these separate silos and these separate sections of the DSM, but are all in the same person, in the same brain, in the same nervous system, and they function together. And so this is part of a taking an integrated approach. I think, is helping to think through this with the patient of how this might be useful from their experience, even though it may be very transient and short-lived and maladaptive. It's an important concept, I think. So switching gears a little bit, because... Clarissa and I definitely experienced this. We're very out there, right? We're putting our message out there about food addiction. We're food addiction clinicians. This is what we treat. This is who we work with. And so we often receive pushback from the eating disorder world. And so we were wondering, you know, what was the response to your book, Eating Disorders, Addictions, and Substance Use Disorders? You know, how did the eating disorder community receive the book? Was there any pushback or was there, did anybody reach out and say, teach me? Thank you for that question. Yes, I think uh, I want to acknowledge my co-editor, Amy Baker, Dennis, as well. And it was just a delight to work with her on putting that together. And it's, you know, we're very proud of that accomplishment. But I think our book was very well received for the most part. It was really the first textbook that systematically examined the overlap between eating disorders, substance use disorders, and addictions. I think it stimulated a lot of discussion and interest in the field although there continues, there remains a big divide between the subspecialties to this day, but we'd like to think that we helped bridge that gap. I think uh, it gave a lot of people food for thought, no pun intended. And I know a lot of my colleagues uh, bought the book and uh, they have it on their desk to what extent they utilize it. I don't know. But yeah, I think the field has advanced since then. There certainly has been pushback, particularly the sections about food addiction that are in the book. I myself wrote a chapter in there or eating disorders addictions and kind of reviewed the literature up to that point. And all of the major behaviors that we see associated with eating disorders, whether it be dieting or, or starvation, binge eating, purging, compulsive exercising, as well as diet pill abuse can be seen as addictive behaviors. And there is a literature for each one of those and kind of reviewed that. So food addiction is embedded in that chapter. And there's a lot of other discussion in the book about food addiction, and including a chapter by Ashley Gerhardt. But uh, there continues to be pushback that's prominent around the issue of food addiction. And it comes largely out of the eating disorder community. It comes a lot from dietitians. There is a real persistent dogma that there are no bad foods that comes out of the eating disorder field, despite evidence to the contrary. And I, and I can understand that perspective when you're dealing primarily with low-weight individuals with anorexia nervosa who can be extremely phobic about certain foods, particularly higher calorie foods, particularly with carbohydrates and fat, and that they do need to eat balanced diets and learn how to do that in moderation. And I get that. I get that. The, the issue becomes, you know, those who, who are binging, particularly the great excess, excess, and particularly those who have underlying trauma and are using food as a substance to self-medicate. And the whole self-medication hypothesis that originated out of the substance abuse field, which is for the most part, been proven true by tons of research. It's, I think, is also true for how to understand the role of trauma and food addiction in eating disorders. So I think it's just a matter of continuing to teach people. And, and you know, there is one size does not fit all and that we, you know, we give lip service to the idea that we need to individualize treatment for people to do a comprehensive evaluation on each and, and every person and to tailor our treatments to that person's needs. But, you know, that's a goal that hasn't been often realized, particularly in large treatment programs that do things a certain way. And, you know, bad habits are hard to change. 
So, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. It's evolving, but I think more research is going to help soften that rigidity. So I thought it would be important for our audience to hear in the, in your book, you wrote with up to 50% of eating disorder patients meeting the criteria for a substance use disorder or addiction and one third of substance use disorder patients reporting eating pathology. It's remarkable how few people there are that are fully trained to address both disorders. And we've talked a little bit about this. Why aren't we hearing more about making this mandatory? As someone who experienced, you know, treatment in substance use facilities where, you know, there was a lot of junk food, there was, you know, food was not seen as like a part of medicinal treatment, right? And and your relationship with food and someone who was in eating disorder treatment and never received any education. Like, how are we going to, like, why aren't we making this mandatory? With those numbers, you'd think that that would have some impact. Well, I guess I would say, who is the we? Because we have, you know, we're all of different disciplines. We're of different dif- disciplines. Uh, and and your listeners are of different disciplines, and they come from different parts of the country, if not world. And we're kind of held hostage to our teachers and in, in what they think we need to know. And the completely different curriculum based on discipline and what school you went to and what you know used to be particularly what school of psychotherapy were you trained in. I think that's less true now. But the fact is that many people have never really learned much about eating disorders. Many people have never really learned much about substance use disorders. Unfortunately, in many parts of the United States, mental health workers get completely different training as well as licensure requirements compared to addiction counselors. And they're not at all the same. They don't have the same licensure requirements or degrees or letters behind their name. And it's as though these are separate entities. When substance use disorders and addictive disorders are mental disorders, and there's enormous comorbidity. As I said earlier, comorbidity is the rule rather than the exception. So it, it's extremely short-sighted. Unfortunately, you know, I have to say, I mean, you live in Canada where you have a completely different, Clarissa, you live in Canada, Molly, you're in Montana, but Clarissa, you live in Canada where you have universal health care and a completely different system. And I'm familiar with it. I've got very good friends who work at McGill in Montreal and other parts of Canada. And it's a really a different ballgame. And, and just hearing from other researchers and clinicians from other parts of the world and visited other parts of the world, it's completely different. And ours is very much of a money-driven, profit-driven, capitalistic venture. I hate to say it, but it's true. And if you don't have insurance, and even if you do, it's limited in terms of the, the care. It's limited everywhere, but it's a different kind of mechanism and in, in process in terms of accessing care. And so I, I hate to say, but, the, but I think the systems in which we deliver the care is part of the problem in terms of delivering integrated care. There are a lot of specialty programs that I think mean well, but are limited in terms of their ability to deliver care to these other comorbid conditions. And insurance companies, you know, are complicit because they insist on having a primary diagnosis. And what's primary when you've got bulimia nervosa, food addiction, PTSD, major depression, ADHD, you know, it's really somewhat artificial to say, well, it's the eating disorder that's primary, which means that's the one I'm going to focus on the most to the exclusion relatively to the others, even though the others may or may not be addressed. And so there's so many elements and levels of problem, you know, intervention or lack thereof. Yeah, I think it's a failure of training. It's a failure of, you know, a lot of places don't have any services for eating disorders, like in psychiatry, let's just say, because I'm most familiar with that, it, being a psychiatrist. If you do your training in an academic center or a, re, or a program that does not have a, an eating disorder delivery system, you're going to learn, you might get a lecture or two, your entire residency training. You may or may not get a patient at all. And if you do, you're not going to have supervisors who really know 
much about treating that. And so you're going to be deficit, frankly, whereas you may train in a place that has a wonderful program and may rotate on that unit and see people with severe eating disorders and really get how devastating they can be and how life-threatening they are and, and, and so on. And you come out with a completely different experience. And there's just such a dramatic difference. And this is true for psychology. It's true for social work. It's true for counseling. It's true for dietitians. It's true for every level, every professional that typically is involved in eating disorder treatment. And then, as I said, if you're in certain states like South Carolina, where I live, the licensing requirements for mental health counseling versus uh, addiction counseling is completely different. And, and many addiction counselors think that the only viable uh, treatment for substance use is a 12-step approach, which is also highly problematic. And I think that's one of the fears of people in the field of eating disorders who, when you start talking about food addiction, they automatically think that you're talking about Overeaters Anonymous or you're talking about 12-step programs and you're talking about a, a completely eliminating white flour and sugar. And it doesn't necessarily mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean that a 12-step program is going to be what's good for that individual. And so there's a, a lot of misinformation, a great need for, for more knowledge and teaching and, uh, and curiosity, I think, on the part of therapists and psychiatrists and doctors involved to learn more. So often I've found that once people stop their training, they, they don't think they have to learn anything anymore. And that is one of my pet peeves, regardless of what discipline you're in. You know, I think we have at some level a moral and professional and ethical obligation to keep up to what extent we can. You know, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of articles published every day in medicine and the neurosciences and the psychological sciences, hundreds every day. And it is impossible to completely keep up, but you can make some effort to keep abreast because things have changed tremendously in my 44 years since I, you know, went to medical school tremendously and they are going to keep changing and they, and they're accelerating that change. It's accelerating. It's not stopping. And so there are refinements all the time and advances. And I think uh, this is an area that we're going to see continued change in our understanding, conceptualization, and treatment of food addiction and, and, and related eating disorders and other psychiatric disorders and medical disorders, because there's a lot of medical comorbidity as well as psychiatric comorbidity. Yeah, it's so interesting. I feel like so much of my experience has been baptism by fire. So I started mm -hmm. out incorrect actions and realized that the, the, and it was all male facility. And I realized that the men who had mental health things going on were mm -hmm. being sent back to jail and prison at a much higher rate. And so that is what, you know, spurred me on to go get my master's degree and become a licensed clinical professional counselor. I never had any interest in addiction, even though we were treating addiction there. But then in the end, I went ahead and w became dual licensed in addiction because I'm like, whatever, like the vast majority of people I see who come to me for anxiety and depression also have substance use disorder going on or some yes. degree of it, you know, and, and I experienced a lot of prejudice, even trying to rent an office space because they didn't want my clientele there because I was working with department of corrections. I was working with child protective services, right? Wow. I was working with people who were the judges were like doing intervention programs on their own to keep them out of just County jail. And the other therapists in the building would be like, we don't want your clients here. No. And it was just so, so interesting how they could, you know, not see that they were part of the problem. Right. And this is, it's so much a part of the problem. And now I'm experiencing it again in the food addiction world. And I'm just so exhausted, but hearing you speak about it, reading your book, talking to people like David Wiss as well, because I think you guys are on the same page as us. Like we need to bridge that gap. And so, you know, what will it take to make that cross training happen and further that collaborative research? Like what, what is the barrier to that? Or is it just a matter of you, Dr. Burton, do you just need to create that program? I'm just going to go ahead and volunteer you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate your comments, Molly. I can really resonate with them. And I, I'll get up on my soapbox again. You know, you are a caring person and you wanted to do well by your patients. 
right? And so even though we may not particularly have a great interest in substance use disorders, the fact that your patients right there sitting before you had those issues, you had compassion enough and motivation enough to go learn about those conditions so that you could be in service to your patients or clients. And I think that's kind of what happened with me as well going along the way. If you really care enough about doing a good job and being in service to the people that you're seeing, then you will learn about whatever it is that ails them and how you can best treat that particular condition, right? And so bravo, bravo. I forgot your question. Yeah. So what is it? No, that's okay. So what is it, you know, how do we bridge that gap so that we have more of that cross training happening, that there's more collaborative research that we come down from our towers (laughs) and meet, you know, in Switzerland or something. I don't know, like what program exists to do that? I don't know. (laughs) I really don't know. I think, you know, I think keeping people continually curious you know, there are, there are so many levels of the problem. Not enough time. People are focused on just making money. If you work, you know, more and more people are working for a programs, either the government or for corporations, and then they want to squeeze as much time out of you as they possibly can. And so people, you know, I know in certain systems, therapists are expected to literally work every hour seeing patients and generating income. And they don't have time to learn. They don't have time to go to the library. They don't have time to access articles. And then you've got the issue of not being able to access articles because unless you're a member of that organization, which sponsors that particular journal, you have to pay 35, 40, 50 bucks to access an article. And so there's a barrier between academia and clinical, the clinical world. There's a barrier between, you know, the the so-called research practice gap is very, very real. And it's perpetuated by some of the practices in academia and by corporations and governments who employ people and people in private practice. It's the same thing. They don't have time or they think they don't to learn about these new things and new ways of thinking. So, you know, the average period of time between a new finding in research and its application in clinical practice, do you know how long that is estimated? 17 years. 17 years is is on average between the time that something comes out in a journal, a peer-reviewed journal, and it's actually taken and integrated into first-line clinical care. And I I think that's been true for the role of trauma and PTSD and eating disorders, for example. We first published results from the National Women's Study in 1997, and people thought this was crazy, and people didn't really go out and start treating PTSD and eating disorders. It it really took, took about 20 years for people to really finally accept because other research was done and people developed more clinical experience and they started asking the right questions and the whole issue of child abuse and adverse child experiences and PTSD kind of took on a a kind of critical mass in the field. The fields of psychiatry, psychology, mental health became more apparent and a, a more apparent problem and factor in all of mental illness, then it became more accepted within the eating disorder field and people started paying attention to it and treating it and integrating it into their approach. And, but that took about 17 years for that to really begin to happen. And that's just one example that's in my experience in my lifetime, and there are many others. So food addiction, you know, it's only been around, what, 11, 12 years, 13 years maybe? Yeah. So it's coming. It's time is coming. (laughs) So we as individual clinicians just really need to soak up as much knowledge as we can and offer the people that we're working with all of the options that we can for treatment. And I think it's, I just love the passion that you talk about helping individuals. And so with our signature question, we wonder today if you could share, you know, If a listener is just starting out on their recovery journey, what does that person need to hear right now? Well, I think a lot of things come to mind. Never give up hope, for one. If you have a bad experience with one therapist or doctor, find another one. Keep looking. Keep shopping, right? We're not all the same. We don't all think the same. 
healing is possible. There is a lot of misinformation out there. I want to say in particular, diets don't work, uh, at least in the traditional sense of having weight loss as a primary goal. So often people with food addiction are also struggling with their weight, with overweight or obesity. And particularly a lot of people in the medical profession will say, well, just diet and exercise is all you need. Well, no, it's not. That is, we know, further stigmatizing people. And it's really not understanding and and treating the whole person and their experience that led them up to this point in time. Uh, particularly in regards to traumatic experiences. Again, I'm going to invoke that. I think it's such an important thing to at least explore and find out about to what extent trauma, PTSD, has played a factor in that person's life because trauma gets biologically embedded in the organism. And that's uh, really become quite clear and quite apparent from a, a variety of research. And we review that in, David Wiss and I review that in a couple of the articles that we've written about adverse child experiences and obesity, and more recently, limitations of the protective measure theory when it comes to trauma and obesity and eating disorders. So pay attention to what works for you. I think we all have kind of an inner healer, and we know at some level what we need. And to listen to that voice and to follow that voice, right? A lot of people know they need to stop eating sugar and, and highly processed foods, but they know that, and they know that they're addicted to it, and but they think they can't stop. It's not true. You can with the right help, with the right support. You don't have to keep eating what big food says you should be eating. So those are some messages I would leave with you. For starters, I could probably go on and on, but um, I won't. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It has been an honor and a pleasure just to listen to your wisdom and knowledge. And thank you so much for sharing it with our audience today. It's been my pleasure. And again, thank you for inviting me and good to meet you all. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one -on -one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>